these are vision boards created by six Milwaukeeans who were asked to illustrate their vision of what Milwaukee could look like in the next 12 to 18 months. Good evening. I'm Alexandria Mason, and this is a special edition of Black Nouveau. The vision boards you've just seen are part of a project called Milwaukee's Promise. It was created by a face familiar to the Black Nouveau family, James E. Causey. James is a Milwaukee Journal Sentinel Projects reporter, as well as an O'Brien Fellow at Marquette University. He spoke with the creators about their boards in a recent Listen MKE Facebook production. This edition of Black Nouveau features highlights from that event. Listen MKE is a community project and partnership between the Ideas Lab of the Milwaukee Journal Sentinel, WUWM 89.7 FM, Milwaukee's NPR, the Milwaukee Public Library, and Milwaukee PBS. Its purpose is to create listening opportunities for residents living on the city's north side. And joining us to further explain the vision boards and Milwaukee's promise is James E. Causey. Welcome, James. Thanks for having me. So tell us a little bit more about what Milwaukee's Promise is. Well, Milwaukee's Promise is part of a year-long uh, project that I've been working on for the Milwaukee Journal Sentinel as part of a O'Brien Fellow at Marquette University to look at some of the nagging issues that's been plaguing this city for quite some time. You know, I'm looking at issues of housing and lack of African-American home ownership. I'm taking a look at incarceration, which will be the next installment coming out in, over the next month. I'm also looking at uh, how we can better build community police relations and how we deal with the issue of race and race relations in our city. Um, one, of, one of the first engagement events that we decided to do is uh, a vision board event. And what I wanted to do with that vision board event was give community leaders a chance to define what they believe a vision for the city should be 18 months from now. What do they want the city to look like and what elements should the city have? Um, I don't think our political leaders have done a really good job on explaining what their vision for the city should be. I mean, if you were to talk to most citizens and say, what's the jobs plan for this city? I don't think most people could tell you because it hasn't been clearly defined. So I wanted to give that power to our community leaders and have them define it. And what were some recurring themes that you saw across the vision boards? Uh, the main theme that I kept coming across is accountability. Um, a lot of our uh, community leaders don't feel that there's real true accountability to a lot of the issues that we have in our city. And as a result, that comes down to a lack of vision. Um, leaders haven't defined what their vision is for the city moving forward, so it's hard to hold them accountable when things go awry. And so accountability is one of those main issues that all of the uh, community leaders said that they really wanted to see uh, uh, up high. And uh, another issue that a lot of the leaders pointed to is uh, uh, respect and uh, better community police relations. Those are two critical issues that um, uh, seems to come up a lot when, when we do vision board events. Thank you for that, James. And now let's go to the vision boards and hear from the creators. For me, James, my vision starts, vision starts with accountability, right? And the reason why I start there is because I recognize that Milwaukee has already started some great work when it comes to anti-poverty, uh, safe places for Black families, and then equitable, um, equitable resources. But I want to make sure that um, Milwaukee also does a great job of holding itself accountable to not only continuing that work, but getting better at doing that work. So in the front, you'll see that I have anti-poverty. Um, that particular concept for me, it truly means what can we do as a city to ensure that we're eliminating both the risk factors and the conditions of poverty, right? People shouldn't have to um, commit crimes in order to meet their own needs. Instead of us criminalizing people and vilifying people, um, we should also look at what are the conditions that create the need for people to meet their needs in ways that are not as productive, right? And so really understanding the anti-poverty for me, it really means starting with a lens of empathy, and it really connects itself to equitable resource distribution. Um, so anti-poverty for me has is the tallest fear. Um, not only that, but poverty itself has so many impacts on our minds, on our children, on our families, people not being able to get to work, 
not being able to meet their needs, and then looking to cope with those things, potentially with drugs and or crime or something else, right? And so looking at it holistically and saying, what can the city do to not only eliminate people from being poor, but also address some of those uh, risk factors for poverty, and even heal some of that trauma of how we treat people, how we treat people and talk about them when they are poor. Take me to some of the other things on your board. Yeah, so uh, there's anti-poverty in the front. Over at Equitable Resources, that's the orange, okay. um, the orange area. And you'll see, actually, if you zoom in and go down a little bit, you'll see two cars I tried to create. Oh, that's really <laughs> cool. Talk about county contracts and quality education. Um, I wanted to highlight two of our largest institutions um, because they're already doing some of this work, right? We know the county um, has already declared uh, race a, 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 an emergency. Right. Uh, racism, a, a health, public health crisis. Yes, a public health crisis. And we see that NPS is also doing some work to reduce the amount of young people of color that they're suspending and or reprimanding disproportionately, right? And so once again, we're talking talking about accountability. And so I recognize that we've, we've already noticed these things, but now what I'm saying is how can we hold each other accountable to doing these things long-term, right? When trauma and racism and anti-racism are longer, no longer a buzzword, we want to make sure we are electing and hiring and listening to people from all different races, all different backgrounds to really add to what it, what it can look like for us to distribute resources, rather it be academic resources, rather it be um, financial resources, neighborhoods, in a way that really builds us all up. Quickly take me to the other part of your uh, vision board. Yeah, and so we know that for a long time we have been considered the um, worst place to raise a Black child. And I'm just like, I don't, there's so many things connected to that. A part of it is the fact that many African American families exist in poverty and that um, a lot of us don't actually have a lot of resources di being distributed with equity. Um, and so I wanted, wanted to highlight that in this continuum of conversation and say, you know what? Our goal should be the safest place to raise Black children. Um, and that is going to be important for us to support Black parents. It's going to be important for us to change the way that we see Black families and representation and leadership as well. There are four pillars that I highlighted um, for my vision board, and it's really education, uh, humanity, uh, health, and business or justice. So um, I'll start with education. And I think that education um, is really important in terms of, you know, because I have a child, I have a black child at that. And, you know, there are some things that are just not um, met, unfortunately. But if you can see in the center of the board, all four pillars, it requires us to focus on accountability. Um, the last presenter, we all have a common thread of accountability. So there is a level of accountability that you have to hold yourself as well as, um, you know, these individuals that hold these high places within the educational system, right? So, um, you know, when we talk about poor housing, gentrification, there has to be accountability there. First of all, the accountability that I take for myself before I can ask the city, to be mindful of that is to be educated. We have to find ways to educate ourselves on what is gentrification. How do I become um, a homeowner versus a renter? You know, what are laws, what are some laws in place that have prevented us or that um, keeps us you know, in this renting position and so forth. So those are some things that I really have taken personal myself. What I'm asking for the city on a vision board um, aspect is nothing that I have not taken personal myself or that I've, I've attempted and I continue to do the work for, right? So um, when we talk about the dream of, you know, having a home, there comes, you know, there are some things that have really prevented us as a community and I don't want to say Black people, just Black people, but I think that as a whole, you know, our city has really suffered with, um, you know, just holding one another accountable and allowing opportunity for all people. Um, as you go down to, um, I think it's the left right hand, yes, we still have account, unaccount, we have accountability. That is still the focus that, you know, we have to look at the injustices that are around us and we have to 
literally hit that on the nail. And what is that? What is that in our city, our city specifically? What is defunding? We need to break down what is defunding to us. Does that mean funds are allocated somewhere else? And then if they are, where are those funds going to be allocated to? So we have to make sure that we are aware of what those injustices are and work collaboratively, work collectively, and make sure that we're all aligned. Everyone has a role in this vision, right? So it's not just one person and it's not just one person that can do the job. There's many of us that have been gifted to ensure that the vision is, you know, um, that the vision continues to move forward. And sometimes it requires us to pass the baton. When we talk about accountability, um, there are some individuals that have been in places for a very long time. And now it's time to revisit you know, if this person serves a purpose for our city any longer. It's a lot going on on my vision board, but I really want to focus on some of the things that um, everybody so far hasn't. Um, one thing I just want to say is that moving forward, I think that um, we have to do some of the things that I have on the board. So from working grassroots and working with people from the top to the bottom, these are the things that I came up with uh, for changing the city. First, we need to respect and have a little more love in the village mentality and bring that back. And I think that the community, the police in the city of Milwaukee need to come more together on a lot of things. And if anybody can see that bright yellow, it says pay the organizers. Um, that's a huge problem in the city. If you look at 2015 up until recently, the homicides that went down each year from 2015, and they spiked up tremendously this year since we've been in um, the pandemic. So my thoughts, and I want to get this out to everyone in the city, is that the MPD and the city of Milwaukee cannot do it alone. When the community outreach was limited and the organizers were limited in the work and the outreach they could do, you saw homicides spike. You saw um, suicides, domestic violence spike. So pay the organizers. We're out here. A lot of experts um, bring us to the table and they don't support us in the work. Just imagine what we can do. Um, and I want to break down, if you go a little over, it says it's mental illness crossed out. I want to shift the mental stigmas that are in our community and in the city of Milwaukee. And I want us to shift the focus. And instead of saying mental illness, focusing on mental wellness. I think um, the healers of the city and the people of the city, it's a lot of tension. And I think a lot of people need to focus on mental wellness in these times. Um, a lot of things we need to support are small business incubators. Uh, you'll see in and out of the vision board, I have voting and ballots because as it was already stated by Natalie, vote is what we need for change we need people to get out you know and so i just want to remind everybody of what we need to do the city of milwaukee needs to fix the properties and we need to look at community house options eco art transforming the lots into healthy spaces for healthy neighborhoods and we need to really zoom in on things we can do to stop the violence which goes back to a lot of what i said already earlier and the one last thing I want to touch on is the different intersections in this city. That's a whole nother topic, but I would love to see more people coming together from all walks of life, from all identities, from all different cultures, and just breaking all of those barriers to fight what we're all really fighting. I was really focused on the idea of uh, nothing for us, without us. Um, and I was taught that at Urban Underground uh, when I was younger, and there were so many conversations going on about what was best for young people without including them in the conversation. So when I got this opportunity to create this vision board for the vision of Milwaukee, my first thought is like, how can I get my fellow Milwaukeeans a part of this conversation? Um, and as you can see on my vision board, people have a lot to say. Um, and a lot of what they are saying is uh, they have the same vision that I also have for Milwaukee. And I think that's very important for us to really take note of the things that people are saying that they need within their community, uh, within their neighborhoods, um, and in Milwaukee as a whole. Um, 
I, I asked a few more questions following this opportunity and me creating the vision board and tried to get some insight from folks on what it is that they love about Milwaukee, because I think it's important that we come into this conversation from an asset based lens and understanding there are some great things in Milwaukee. So how can we duplicate the greatness instead of spending too much time focusing on the things that aren't going well in our city? So I think about places like the Sherman Phoenix and how amazing and how much of a staple that space has been for our city. Um, collect collaborative economics, when we talk about Sherman Phoenix, the Bronzeville Collective and other spaces around Milwaukee, where they're bringing black owned businesses together um, to, to just make an amazing impact in our city uh, and help those small business owners who don't uh, usually get the support that they deserve and that they need in order to sustain um, within our city. I also, um, got some feedback from folks around the importance and the value of intergenerational conversations. I feel like we just live in a different time where a lot of people talked about accountability and too often we deal with adults who are fearful of young people and won't have a conversation with them and won't get them involved in, in supporting them in their growth. And it reminded me, Ms. Venus is also on this call and I was at the Sherman Phoenix not too long ago and she she uh, stopped me and she was like, oh, we got to take care of that uh, issue that you were having. And that made me feel so warm inside to know that another adult in our community, you know, cared about someone else. Not she's not my family. She's not, you know, she's just someone in the community who cares about other people in the community. And I really, really value that. And I think that's something that Milwaukee needs to, to replicate people in Milwaukee who just genuinely care about other people and want to make a positive impact on uh, everyone's life. So another thing that I uh, noticed that people talked about was just like urban agriculture and making sure that we have, you know, gardens and things like that. And not only have gardens in Milwaukee, that's not the only thing that's important, but educating the, the community and young people on the importance of having um, conversations around urban agri agriculture and having these gardens within our communities and being able to eat healthy foods and I heard, I think it was Natalie who mentioned uh, food deserts and me being able to learn about that in a youth program in Milwaukee at a young age and, and now be able to teach those same things to the young people that I work with in the city um, has been very, very valuable. And I think that's another thing that we should be mindful of is how can we pour into these young people so that they can continue to pour into young people uh, generations to come uh, way beyond the impact that we're able to make right now. My vision board is a little different. I kind of looked at, well, there's not really too much. Um, I looked at what is Milwaukee going to look like in 2021? And I thought about a game show type of aspect. And it's titled the Milwaukee 2021 Game Show because everyone will not be able to play within this movement. But I think everyone is going to want their opportunity to get a get a get get an opportunity to spin the wheel, if I, if I can say that. So I'll start over to the left. Uh, there's been three major things that's impacted 2020 or that is going to impact this year, which is COVID-19, the Black Lives Matter movement, and now we're in the election um, year for our new president. So the will is, um, I kind of divided it up to kind of touch on all of those matters. Um, I'll start with the COVID effect. Um, what I feel the COVID effect is going to do for 2021, specifically here in Milwaukee, is not only is it going to create a gerber generation, we're going to get a, a heap load of new generational babies coming into the world and they're going to come in different creeds and colors. But if you notice the pictures underneath the babies, you see pictures of family bonding and things that we see within the commercials um, sometimes during our favorite shows where families are out swimming or they're gathering together to go on a walk or they're doing things within the kitchen. Um, the COVID has actually created a new movement of learning to unify with your families and bonding with your families in ways that may not have been what we have normally paid attention to before COVID-19. It's given people an opportunity to reconnect with their families in ways that I think is going to be powerful for 2021 and give us a sense on what it is to be family embraced and family bonded in a whole new aspect. If you scroll down a little and you see justice for people, 
I particularly took a lot of time in this area because right now you see, if you notice the young man with the hat sitting on, it seems like he's sitting on the shoulder of the guy with the microphone. And then you see the two black men down in the corner, just dressed as average, just an average day. But what we're going to see is a shift in the imagery of black people. We're no longer going to be viewed as criminals. We're no longer, there's going to be a shift in the way that we are viewed um, where it's going to move from a movement of just normal lounge of urban wear to suits and ties and business aspects. You're going to see a powerful voice of a black person that is going to represent justice for people. And it's going to represent justice for people as far as all different cult, all different types of people within our black community, specifically our LGBT population, our trans population. Um, you're going to see someone or some individuals that is going to be a voice for all of us that is going to speak in unity of all of us and not just parts of us. We're going to learn to unite as a culture and use that, use that unity to provide a voice for the community, if that makes sense. So as we're looking in this moment that we are in, it's a moment of opportunity, no matter how we choose to see it. Yes, we're in a moment of crisis and transition and change in 2020, but more than anything, we should see this as a solutions driven moment. So I wanna talk about, um, there's several, several things that have already been mentioned. I wanna focus in on um, just a few of those things that are also on my um, vision board. I wanna talk about female leadership. Thank you for bringing that up. I, as I look at the city of Milwaukee, um, I look at a city during my 31 years that has been driven um, by males mainly. Um, it is a city that has had consistently male leadership dominant. Um, and so you see, I have that the women of the world must um, be heard. We must hear the voices of women. So in my vision board and in my vision for the next 18 months, I am right here publicly in this moment asking for some of the men who have been in power for a very long time to, to um, relinquish that power, to step back and to understand that if the city um, in, in many aspects is no better than it was when you um, were elected, it's time for you to go. Um, so female leadership and not just black female leadership, but I think that there are solutions um, within a lot of the female leadership and especially women of color who have been bearing the brunt of what is not right um, in this city. I think we have solutions and I think some of those solutions are gonna come not from necessarily women who are already in office, but there are women in our neighborhoods and our communities who need to be strengthened, recognized, empowered and lifted up um, and heard and seen. I would also like to see 12 to 18 months from now, um, each neighborhood, each community. So we have these names um, within our communities. We have neighborhood names. I am calling for um, us as a city to create elder and intergenerational councils for each and every neighborhood that has a name. Um, I am not interested in anyone else solving the problems um, that exist within our communities. The solutions, lie within. Um, so I am asking that we as a city um, begin to cultivate um, neighborhood councils, elder councils, intergenerational councils. We'll be announcing ours at Alice's Garden this September. Um, we are announcing an elder council. And in saying that, um, as someone who will be 60 years old next year, I am um, calling out my peers. I am calling out the elders in this community to say it is time to step up. It is time to stop judging um, young folks who are doing the work. It is time to not be afraid of your own children, your own neighbors. Um, and it is time for us as elders to, to come back to the forefront. We've done the work. It's not new work, but it's time to, to renew that work. Um, I'm calling on education. I want to look at what has happened. So the bridge that has been education um, in this city for young children and this neighborhood needs to be dismantled. Um, we need to dismantle this education system that has not served our children right, but there are solutions to be found. I want to see 
um, every neighborhood again. So I just I want to I want to use the structures that exist, um, all of these named neighborhoods, and in each neighborhood, I am asking for equity. And James E. Causey is here to tell us what's ahead for Milwaukee's Promise. Well, yes. Yeah, so we have a lot of great stories and, and engagement events coming forward. Uh, the next installment will be uh, taking a look at evictions and the eviction crisis that we have here in the city. I had an opportunity to go to uh, New York City and spend some time there to look at how uh, they have this, this program called Right to Counsel that provides uh, free legal representation to people who go to eviction court. And I'm suggesting that that's something that we should strongly consider here. Um, also coming up, uh, mentorship is a, a big issue and how we could get more uh, black male mentors in, involved in education and involved with helping our kids and youth. And community and police relations are, that's a main topic. And so I had a chance to go to uh, Rockford, Illinois to spend some time there to see how they uh, have increased their police community relationships. So we have a lot of really good stories on the horizon. So I want people to really tune in to jsonline.com to really make sure they see these pieces. Thank you so much for that, James. These all are very important issues and we thank you for taking the time to talk to us a little bit more about Milwaukee's Promise. Thank you. You can find the full episode of this Listen MKE session on our website at milwaukeepbs.org. Before we close tonight, we want to remind you that if you have not yet responded to the census, you have until the end of September to do so. You can respond by phone, online, or by mail, but you and your family need to be counted. And you also need to be registered to vote in the upcoming election. And that's all we have for tonight. Thank you for watching this special edition of Black Me Vote. I'm Alexandria Mason and good night.